what do you want your lifestyle to look like? Mm. I think about that all the time. What do I want my lifestyle to look like? Like right now we're traveling, but I always say to my husband, I want a house here, a house here, and a house here. Those mm-hmm. are where I want my three houses. I know what I love. This is what I want. This is my end game. And I don't want to feel that stress every day. So yeah. for me, like private lending doesn't bring me that stress. Raising capital doesn't bring me that stress. Working with great partners on bigger buildings doesn't bring me that stress. It allows me to have the freedom to travel wherever mm-hmm. when I travel. So start at your end game and build backwards. Helping hardworking real estate investors, agents, and entrepreneurs grow a better business, mindset, and future. This is the Carrot Cast Podcast. Now here's your host, Trevor Mock. All right, y'all. <clears throat> we have a returning Carrot Cast guest with us, and she's actually on the road. And we're going to be talking about uh, why that's so special and so cool and and the way that she's been able to structure her business in a way that fuels her family, fuels her passions, fuels exactly what they want in their lives versus the business running them. Uh, They own a business and it supports them instead of them supporting the business like I talk about a lot. So I'm going to introduce you to our guest here in a second. But one of the big topics we're going to talk about that's going to be really relevant for both investors and agents uh, is... Uh, raising funds, raising private funds for if you're wanting to acquire properties, do deals. I think it's going to be something that's going to be even more important as we go into the next three, four years as we're going to see some opportunity opportunities, I feel, in the real estate market. Um, potentially, banks might tighten up a little bit more. Uh, and also, there's just going to be a lot, of, a, a lot of reasons and opportunities for people to pull money out of the stock market, I feel, in two or three years out uh, that you're going to want to be positioned to help them out. And so we're going to be talking to April Crossley today on a whole array of subjects going from private lending, raising uh, capital for your funds, but also why they are out uh, in the middle of Arizona right now, driving around the country with an RV uh, while they still have a business that supports them and how they did that. So April, welcome on the CareCast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. For sure. And so for those of you watching the video version of this on YouTube, if you're not, go to YouTube and look us up, Carrot, and hit subscribe. Uh, April's wearing the old school Carrot T. I love it. <laughs> and we need to get you a new one. I absolutely love it that people wear them so much that they wear out. We get that all the time. And so we're going to get you a new one with the new Carrot logo. We'll get you hooked up. Uh, big time. But April's been a Carrot customer for quite some time now. And uh, she has an amazing business that fuels her her life. And so we'll kind of start there. And April, why don't you um, uh, explain who you are, uh, first of all, uh, where your home market tends to be if you do have a home market and what, what your business looks like now, just so we can set the context. And then sure. we're going to go how you've been intentional building it to serve your family. Sure. So I... Um... I'm a real estate investor based out of Pennsylvania. I live about an hour and a half northwest of Philadelphia in a little town called Reading. Most people don't know where that's at. Mm-hmm. So I always reference Philly. We have um, two flipping companies there. So we flip probably 20 to 30 houses on average a year and have for a long time now. Um, we also have small multifamily rentals like eight units, six units, stuff like that. I stumbled into becoming a private lender. Um, probably four or five years ago. And when I stumbled into that, I was like, wow, this is the most amazing thing because I'm not talking to sellers. I'm not chasing deals. I'm not, yeah. I'm not doing all the things. I'm just kind of looking at the deal once over and writing checks. Um, and now we're really passionate about just private lending into apartment syndications mm-hmm. and raising more money and looking to buy bigger apartment buildings because the whole just syndicating and having a team and being more hands-off, obviously with the lifestyle I'm living now and that I want to live is super important to Mm me. So yeah, let's talk about that right now. So once again, if you're watching the YouTube version of this, uh, you can see April's in, in their truck. So where, where are you at? What, what are you guys doing? Because it sounds really awesome that you get a chance to travel around right now and explore. Yeah, we started... My I had a goal set that by the time I was 40, I did not want to be living in Pennsylvania in the winter. I don't like the snow and the cold and the gray skies. Mm-hmm. So for three years, we were snowbirds and we would come out to Arizona and then um, my husband, my, my son is 25 and moved out and bought his own house back in Pennsylvania. And we kind of had like empty nest syndrome. We're like, well, there's nothing keeping us here. 
and we can run our businesses remotely. My husband's a real estate agent. So we're like, why don't we just Mm. go? So we sold our house because the market's insane and we got a great, made a great profit on it. And we had our RV from snowboarding. And so we just took off and we chased the weather. So we follow the sunshine. So right now it's February and Pennsylvania is sitting in feet of snow and we're in Cottonwood, Arizona and <laughs> enjoying the sunshine. Yeah. So you you just mentioned something really interesting and awesome. So you guys sold your house. The market is, you know, unarguably it's it's crazy right now, right? It, it's I, I can't imagine it going a lot higher, if at all. It's crazy. And I, I, I just got off of a mastermind that I'm in. And this guy's an entrepreneur, you know, owns a big software company. He's in Utah. He's like, dude, I, I'm selling everything. And I said, you're selling everything. I'm like, like, I thought he meant possessions in the house. He goes, no, I sold it all. I'm selling my house. I sold my condo. I sold almost all my possessions. My car is gone. I said, what are you doing? He goes, well, it's the top of the market. I could bank a lot and I'm moving to Costa Rica and I've got a bus and I'm going to turn it into whatever. So he's, oh, he's so doing something cool. similar. Yeah. I think there's probably a lot of people right now that are that are doing that where uh, you have a little bit more mobility now that your son um, is out of the house uh, yeah. and in and you're at the spot where you've built the business or can support you. And, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, for the rest of this. So I'll give a quick recap. You have rentals. Um, how, if you don't mind sharing, if, if you don't want to share it, you don't have to, but how many units in total do you have? Uh, cause I want to set context for people. So they, so they know on the care cast, we bring on an array of people and all my, my, my aim is to build a business that fuels your passions in your, in your life. And so, uh, if someone has 150 units and is miserable or 300 units or a thousand, I'd much rather, uh, you know, hear from the person that's got X units that's lower than that, that loves life. And so how many units do you have April? And then, um, uh, kind of talk about how that has, has influenced the way that you guys are living your life now because of the passive cash flow. Yeah. So right now we're only holding 35 and at the, we probably purchased about close to 50, but over the past two years, we've been selling like Mm -hmm. crazy rapid fire, especially our single families. Um, so we sell kind of as many a year as our accountant lets us sell Mm -hmm. (laughs) for tax reasons, but for our rental property, we always had the flip business and the flip business was kind of my now income. It paid my bills. And then my rental properties were what I considered my retirement income. So I didn't really touch the cash flow on those. I just let it build up or I dump it back into renovating and improving the rental properties. Mm-hmm. And we've, I tell everyone, just if you're going to buy rentals, hold on for like seven years at least, because that's where you really start to see that breaking point of now you can start um, living off of that income and taking cash flow off when they stabilize. Cause over that time, rents are going up. So your cash flow is getting higher and higher and higher. And we've also been pulling equity off of our rentals now because interest rates are so low. Yep. Um, so the cash flow from the rentals and we still have the flip business. I'm just kind of more hands off on the flip business. So they're both still going and kind of funding the lifestyle that we live now. Mm -hmm. And how are you kind of breaking out a little bit more of the business uh, model? How how are you guys getting the leads overall for the flip business? Um, how, How are you feeling that, that part of the acquisition? Yeah. So our flip business leads carrot, I mean, our Mm -hmm. website, always hands down has provided our best leads. And I don't just say that because I'm on the podcast. That's just how it's been for years. Um, And then we do mail, we do direct mail. Those are the only two things we're doing right now. And we just um, tried and true. That's what's worked for us. It's easy to get caught up in chasing a bunch of other things, but we just kind of track what works and we stick with what works and it's been good. So yeah. I, I want to I want to break this down a little bit because oftentimes people will look at an, at an example they'll listen to this podcast and they'll go okay well she's got you know a few dozen units and she does twenty or thirty um, flips a year and she's traveling and, and we'll look at the person in in a moment in time and it looks like it's forever until I can get to that spot because I'm so far away from where you are but if you really look at the model um, so. Let's kind of break down how you got there, April. Did you start with the house flipping part of it or did you start with rentals? And kind of how did you build up from there? What did one feed into the next? Yeah, we kind of always did both. So so we first did a flip and then we actually bought a six unit and then Mm -hmm. we did some more flips and then we bought some more rentals. So it was always flips and rentals, flips and rentals. The whole time we did that, we used private money. So the flips were really paying off debt Mm -hmm. and... 
I have a bucket system I use, which uh, T. Harvecker talks about in The Millionaire Mind and at his conferences that people run. But I... I stick to that bucket method. And that's really what allowed us to become private lenders. And for us to have this freedom, we're really strict with our money. So when I take profit off a flip, I take like 25% off the top and it goes in a tax bucket and it's just Mm. there to pay taxes. And then I take 10% to go to charity and it's only allowed to go to charity. I take 10%, I put it in what's called a financial freedom account. So that account can only be used for reinvestment. So I can only use it to private lend or I can only use it to put down on a property. It's not allowed to be used for anything else. And then I have um, like 10% that goes to a long-term savings account. These are just what I call them. You can call them whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And that's only for like large house projects for when I owned my home or vacations. That's where I want to go. So I'm pretty, we're pretty, we've always been that way. We're very rigid about where our money goes. And then kind of the rest goes to paying everyday bills. Um, And I talk about the bucket method somewhere on my YouTube channel, one of my videos, but I swear that's what's gotten us where we are today. And we're never, we've, and I guess this goes along with the RV lifestyle. We've never been about things like things Mm -hmm. aren't real important to me. My freedom is more important. So for me to go from living in a house to downsizing an RV wasn't really a big deal because I'm not big on having things to me. It it clutters the mind, like having things really clutters the mind and clutters the soul. Like it's not weighs you down. It's not freeing. If that makes sense. Oh my gosh. So so much sense. Uh, It's funny because I, I didn't used to be this way up until probably like the last five years where um, I was, I was maybe last six or seven years. I wasn't a clean person. Um, I kind of grew up, you know, throwing the clothes in the ground or whatever it was. And I met my wife and she, she is a clean person. So that helped me a lot. Um, but it wasn't until the last five years, especially as carrot has grown and, and, and there started to be a lot more going on around me that I was realizing, like you were saying, all of the distraction around me, the extra thing, the, whatever it is, things are a mental way, whether, whether, whether you're having to actually actively think about them or not, it's there and you have to protect the thing because you bought the thing or you have to, um, you know, walk over the thing and now you've got to think about it or whatever it is. And so, uh, it's going to be really cool, uh, talking to you again, maybe in a year after you guys have been on the road for a bit and, and seeing, uh, now you've seen the other side of it fully. If you're going to start to adopt more things and what those things are, or if you're going to completely say, Hey, we love it like this. And I'm, I'm pumped to hear what it is. Yeah, I'm curious too. We've been on the road since October, so uh-huh. just a couple months. And I, I mean, we met our neighbors the other day at our, the RV park we're staying in. They're like, oh, we gave up everything. The guy was like, I was living in a four bedroom, three full bath house. And one morning I woke up and I'm like, what am I doing? It's just me, my wife, and my dog. I sold everything. We've been on the road for three years. I was <laughs> I like, <it>. wow. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So I'm going to break this, this model apart really quick for y'all. So this is especially um, relevant for all you real estate agents listening to this because uh, I mean, for investors as well, but real estate agents, big time, uh, they're going to be doing, uh, they're going to be doing a lot of transactions. So they're going to get commissions. And oftentimes what the agents do is they're just going to be on commissions for 10, 20, 30 years. And they're going to look back in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years and go, well, shoot, I want to retire, but I didn't really build anything. And so what April did, uh, they went out there and started doing a few flips a year. They took some of that money, like she had said, and they put it in buckets, but then they put part of it into doing uh, buying apartments and, and houses. Then they do more deals and take some of that active income and put it into passive. And over time, you end up building a portfolio. You don't go from zero units to 35 or 50 overnight. It takes, it could take years or a year or five years or whatever pace you want to do. And now that she's got the active pass, uh, cash flow coming in and they're still doing the deals on the, or they've got the passive cash flow from properties and active income from their deals. Now they can look at it, which we're going to talk about now and take that money and do private lending. So we're going to talk about private lending from two angles, uh, if you're cool with it, April. Yeah. Uh, the first angle of how to get it um, and kind of what you do there. And then we're going to talk about the other angle of what you're doing with private lending as an investment, because that's something I've been doing for several years as well. And I love it. Uh, but How have you, let's go back to your very first deal that you did with private money. Um, How did you originally get that private money and where'd you meet that lender? Um, How did that that whole process work for that first deal? Yeah. So our first deal, we didn't 
a wholesaler brought it to us. We didn't know where we were going to find the money. So my husband knew a guy that worked at his office that was flipping houses. And he was like, go to this guy. Let's talk to him. See if, if he has any ideas. So we went to him. We're like, we have this deal. We think it's great. We have no money. It's like, we're young. We're paying off college debt. I had my son. Like, I don't, we don't know where to get money for this. And he's like, oh, well, I'll, I'm always looking for deals. I'll joint venture with you and I'll bring the money. So at the end of the deal, after we had to put in sweat equity and we brought the deal, he brought the money at the end, we split it. And on the HUD, he's getting paid. We're getting paid. This other guy comes and picks up a check and gets paid. I'm like, who's that guy? I haven't seen him (laughs) through this whole like transaction. And he's like, oh, that's my private money lender. And I was Uh like, what is a private money lender? So that was the first time I'm hearing about it and started digging into it. And that private money lender came to us and was like, you know, I'm always looking for more deals to put my money into. I'm a real estate agent and golfing is my passion. I Hmm. golf all the time. I don't have time to look for deals and I don't want, I don't want to deal with it. Like if you're going to do more deals, come to me. So he was our first private money lender. So we found him just by going to someone that had more experience and more knowledge. And we were open and willing to, Hey, we'll split profit. We just want to learn here and like get our foot in the door. And that just bust things wide open. I just started learning more and more about how do I raise capital and how do I find more of these lenders? Because we were finding deals and people had money, but they didn't want to look for deals. So it was like a perfect match. So when you're, when you're reaching out to a private lender, um, what, what are you actually presenting them when you're sending them a deal? Uh, I've, I've had people present me really, really bad presentations and deals and um, really amazing ones. So what does it look like to present something well, that is likely going to get a, a, a lender? Yeah. So as a private lender, I can tell you, I like everything to look clean and simple. I don't want to have to dig through information because most private lenders, the reason they don't do this is, is, and find their own deals. They don't have the time. They run other businesses. They do other things. Um, so I created a deal package and I just paid a guy that's really good at Excel to do it. And it keeps everything in one place. So if you can somehow keep everything in one place, meaning a summary of the deal, like this is a four bedroom, two and a half bath. Here's the reason the seller selling. This is what I love about the school district or the zip code or whatever the case may be. And then we have a tab that's just a breakdown of here's um, the ARV on the property. Here's what I'm going to spend in rehab. Here's my holding costs, my transfer tax, all that. And then here's my resale costs. And here's what I'm asking for from you as the private lender. And this is how much money you're going to make after six months. And then we have another tab where we put all the comps in the spreadsheet. I I do not like when people come to me with a deal and they send me pages and pages of comps that their realtor printed off. And I'm like, I am not going to look through these. (laughs) I, I do not have time for this. So we put it in a spreadsheet so they can look at everything side by side, basically in columns and make sure that they're actual legitimate comps that they're Mm. looking at. So I think just a really nice, clean package. And then usually if they're a new lender, they'll want personal financial information, which you can give them kind of separately. Like, They might ask for a credit check or tax returns or something like that. Gotcha. Yeah. And there's a tool um, because there's probably a lot of people thinking, well, shoot, you know, how how do I go uh, get that spreadsheet created? Well, number one, you can go find someone and just explain to them what what April had said there. Uh, I've got a buddy, Daniil Clayman, who does a ton of deals and he's got a software called Rehab Valuator Um, going way back to 2008. Uh, I helped him do his original launch of that product way back when, uh, and it's kind of really cool seeing it grow. It is a paid product, so you guys, uh, if you're not if you're not doing a lot of developments or or um, or raising money consistently and creating those, go create the darn spreadsheet because um, it is a paid product, but it's a great one. And uh, yeah. guys, that's gonna be important because I know when I'm working with Adrian, who we both know, or other people, it's all about that. If if they can make it easy for me to review the docs and the details, I can make a decision fast. But if it if if they can't, it literally sits in my inbox. I've got great intentions, amazing intentions to get back to them. But I'm like, well, in my mind, I'm looking at the mental commitment and it's a little more than I can take now. So I put it into the future and sometimes I won't get to it, which yeah. sucks. Yeah, I agree. So what type of terms um, are you seeing right now with private lenders? And and for someone who's who's brand new to the private lender side of it, uh, why would someone go with a private lender versus uh, a bank? 
Um, so private lender versus banks, banks usually can't fund quick enough. So when you're dealing with motivated sellers, they usually want to sell real quick and banks will take six to eight weeks and banks typically won't lend on the type of properties we're buying as flippers. Yep. So, um, you know, like rundown roof needs replaced. They don't want to lend on that kind of stuff. So they take too long and they're too picky. Mm. I tell people, people always say to me, well, I can use hard money and I don't have to develop relationships. I'll just go to the internet and type in a hard money lender and get money that way. That's fine too, but you'll never build relationships and you'll never scale. Mm. Like my private money lenders refer me to other private money lenders, which has allowed me to scale. So now if someone comes to me and says, Hey, I have this $14 million apartment building. I'm like, Oh, okay. 14 million doesn't even phase me. Like, yep great. We got funds for that. Let me take a look at the deal. Before I would have been scared. Like, where am I going to come up with down money for that thing? Like, I can't <laughs> buy a $14 million building. But private money lenders refer you and you learn how to create those relationships and grow. And those people want to grow with you because mm -hmm. they trust you. So it's worth going through the effort of finding them and developing those relationships. Um, what was the second part of that question? I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it was bad. It was a really terrible run on questions I threw at you. <laughs> but uh, the, the second one is kind of what are some average terms that you get, uh, that you're seeing right now? Yeah. Yeah. So on flip projects, um, we lend like on flips, we lend long term on some rentals and then we lend into syndication. So on flip projects, we're typically look, I see anywhere from 8% if you have a really good relationship with your private money lender and they know you, they know you and you trust, they trust you. That usually comes over time. But typically it's like 10, 12, 14% on a flip project, sometimes with points, sometimes without points. Um, I have some private money lenders that will hold a loan on a rental for like a year long term at like 7% on a 30 year amortization. But interest rates are so low right now. If you can buy cash and just do a cash out refi, that's yeah. the way to go. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 I, I, I like it. So as far as, as far as your deals go, are you like rule of thumb when you're, when you're buying a deal, do you ever put in your own cash? Or are you pretty much always looking at um, private lender for that part of it? Like where would you use your capital versus a lender? Um, so that's a great question. It varies deal by deal. So sometimes I will put in part of my money and sometimes mm -hmm. I will just use the private lender's money 100%. I can tell you when, you, when you're when you new, if you're brand new, it's always good if you can JV or you have some funds to put. Like sometimes people reach out to me and say, I have $10,000, I'm new to flipping, what should I do with it? Mm -hmm. And I say, hang on to it, keep it liquid, yep. use a private money lender for purchase and some of rehab, but they're going to want you to have skin in the game. So hang on to that 10 grand as your skin in the game. Mm -hmm. My private lenders that have been with me a long time, usually if I send them a deal, they're like, okay, but can I fund the whole thing? Because yep. I want all of my money. Nobody that's wealthy wants their money in a bank account. Nobody, because mm -hmm. you're not earning any return. So they'll say, can I use all of my money on it? So sometimes I'm, I'm like totally fine with that. So I just want <laughs> everyone to grow wealth. Yep. And honestly, a lot of times our money is out in other deals. So like we lend to flippers, we lend to syndicators, like... So our money's always coming and going. So if mm -hmm. I have a flip project, I'll be like, hey, I can fund rehab and you can fund purchase or you can fund the whole thing. And most times, yeah. because I have these long-term relationships, they're like, can I please fund the whole thing? Mm -hmm. If it's I, a new lender, I'll usually have them fund part and I'll fund the other part so they can get their feet wet and like see how I operate and I can see how they operate to see if we're going to be like a good match. And then the risk is lower because they have less money into it. So that, that right there is really, really good distinction. I want everyone to remember that because, um, cause that, that is the key. I, I know for me as a private lender, uh, that has been very true where when I work with someone at, at the start, it's kind of, you get your foot in the door. It's a, the minimum investment, whatever will work. It's 25 K or 50 or whatever it is. Uh, but now with Adrian's deals, as an example, I tend to fund most of those. It's the same way. It's like, dude, I just want to fund it all. Like what's the site? Is there, do you have more coming? Yeah. Uh, and as the person starts to get a good track record, like you're saying, trust is built and then it's cool. Let's write bigger checks. And let's take care of this. So that's a really, really good tip. I love yeah. it. Um, so let's, let's switch sides of it now. So for those who have had a chance to kind of build their snowball and they've, they've, um, you know, built a good active income business or passive income, they've got some cash on the side and they're looking at, uh, the stock market and they didn't lose all their money in GameStop and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so what, 
when did you start to switch to uh, putting some of your capital into being a private lender yourself? And do you do other investments outside of real estate and private lending? Like, are you in the stock market? Are you doing anything like that? Or, or what, what are you doing? So when, when did you start private lending and, and why? Yeah. So I started private lending when I was raising money to private lend. So I was actively mm-hmm. reaching out to people and raising money. And I met with a guy that for coffee and I wanted him to be a private lender. And it was a super embarrassing meeting. So he started asking me all these questions about what I'm invested in. Mm -hmm. And I was telling him I was so proud because I had a Roth IRA with Morgan Stanley and I flip houses. And I was so proud of this Roth because I had it since I was 20. And I'm probably like 32 (laughs) years old, probably 10 years ago, meeting with this guy. And he starts asking me like, what fees are you paying your financial advisor? What are you invested in through your Roth? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I can't answer all these questions. I can't answer anything. So I'm like sinking into my chair as he's asking me questions. Like he would never lend to me. I don't even know what I'm invested in. (laughs) So he just looked at me and brutally, honestly, was just like, April, why are you invested with Morgan Stanley? If you um, know about real estate and you seem to be really good at it, why aren't you private lending on real estate with a self-directed IRA? Yep. And the first words out of my mouth were, is that even legal? Like, that sounds illegal. <laughs> and he's like, it's not illegal. So I had old retirement accounts because I worked in healthcare before I um, re- retired to do my next career in real estate. So I rolled over my old retirement accounts into a self-directed IRA and started private lending. Um, so I only had a small amount. So that was probably probably seven years ago, maybe, that I mm-hmm. did that. And then just slowly started building up my retirement account to lend more and more. The self-directed IRA, um, how how does that work? So are are you able to cut a check from that? And and how long how long does it take to for them to get that check or that wire if it's a quick close? Yeah, it's not bad at all. So my I use my self-directed IRA of lenders that have self-directed IRAs. Typically, it's a three to five day turnover period. Mm-hmm. Like you submit your paperwork, they approve it, and they're wiring out the money. And that whole process usually takes about three to five days. Okay. And it works just like any other retirement account, only you can invest it in real estate. And you can have checkbook control with some companies. So if you don't want to wait on someone to do a wire, you can do checkbook control. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause yeah. right now it's mainly just not putting the time to get it solved. I've got, um, a self-directed IRA that's literally in stocks right now. So it's not because it's just, you put the money there for getting some tax savings. I forget about it, but all my lending is just coming out of my bank account right now. And so I'm paying yeah. full taxes on all that, which really sucks. So that's one of my, one of my big action items. I finally need to step forward and just get that taken care of. And, uh, you've re-inspired me to, to, to get that done there. Um, April, any, anything people should look out for if they are going to start to be, to be a private lender, what should they look out for to protect themselves and find good investments? Yeah. I typically tell people that are new to private lending, not to lend to new flippers. Mm -hmm. So a great way to find borrowers, private lenders will ask me, how do I find borrowers? And I usually say, who organizes your local meetup group or your local RIA meeting? Start there go to the meeting, network with people. Don't go there and say, I'm a private lender because everyone's just going to bombard you. Mm -hmm. But if you just go there and say, hey, I'm a real estate investor and you network, you start talking to people, you'll realize who runs a good like business where they're tracking their numbers and they really know what they're doing. They've been at it for a while and who's just kind of flying by the seat of their pants, I guess you want to call it. Um, I also, private lenders will reach out to me and I always recommend they lend in their backyard first if possible Mm. because it makes them feel more secure because they can drive past the property and look at it and talk to that borrower face to face before they start lending like on the other side of the country to someone Mm -hmm. that they don't know so just from mastermind groups really sometimes i'm referring people private lenders reach out to me i'll say what state are you in oh i know a guy that has a great company in that state let me connect Mm. you with him so you can start in your backyard gotcha yeah so networking with other private lenders is a great way to vet borrowers i love it i love it so i i want to i want to wrap the podcast with the where we started at, at the beginning with building a business that that fuels you and that serves you. And so before we hit record, uh, one thing that we were talking about was was not being lured by other people's goals, not being lured by, well, that person's doing more, maybe I should too. So um, let's talk about that for a few minutes, April. 
how, how are you right now making sure that you're intentional, that your business is just as big as it needs to be to support what you and your family want and not too big to where it adds extra stress? What are you doing to make sure you're, you're checking that box and not, not going into the extra stress mode for no extra yeah. return? I really focus on what I love and what's important to me. So it's very easy to get caught up in. I should flip not 20 houses, but 50 or 100 mm-hmm. a year. That's what I should be doing. But Honestly, Trevor, like when I sit back and I look at all my businesses, I'm like, I do not like flipping houses. Like, I don't like it. I started it and it's great income and it fuels my private lending bucket. It is not what I'm passionate about. So I'm like, do I really want to put a lot of time and energy into growing that side of things? Not really. Um, And I I try not to get distracted by owning thousands and thousands of units. I just think about what's on my heart and what I want to do next. And I stay focused on that. So for me, when I sit in silence with myself and think what really excites me, Mm. like what brings up like that excitement that I can't sleep because I just want to work on something. It always comes back to raising money and buying a larger apartment building on syndication with just like great partners and private money lenders that align with my same values that something we can all work together so it's not sucking all my time, but mm-hmm. I have a huge piece in it and I'm balanced with all these people I love working with. That excites me. That really excites me. So I try to stay intentionally focused every day on just what lights me up inside and not what... I don't feel like what you do daily and what you're growing should make you feel like, Ugh, like Mm-mm. bring you <laughs> stress. No. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's always a, a point of diminishing returns with, with income or with number of deals or whatever it is. And, and that's the thing I, I want to challenge everyone listening to this uh, to do is, is really do what April's done and say, okay, what's the end game? You know, what, what do I want to go towards? What do I want to grow towards? Uh, what, why am I even doing this? And then next, what she had said was find what gives you energy, find what motivates you and, 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 and spend more of your time each week on that, trim the stuff that doesn't, uh, but don't build it past the point to where, uh, there's the diminishing returns on, on, um, uh, lifestyle, on happiness, on free time to do what you want to do. And don't let your business suck you into things that you don't enjoy. And I think we've all experienced it where businesses have done that. And even with carrot, you know, I've, I've had to wrestle that each year. It's like, well, shoot, cause should we keep growing this thing? And where, where, how do I need to change my job in this? And so it never ends y'all. It, it never ends, but we have to always be thinking about exactly what April talked about. What I challenge myself to think about every year is like, all right, what am I signing up for this year? And what am I intentionally doing? And why am I doing that? Yeah. Uh, and um, then you're going to build a, a great business. You bring up a great point about the end game. What do you want your lifestyle to look like? Mm-hmm. I think about that all the time. What do I want my lifestyle to look like? Like right now we're traveling, but I always say to my husband, I want a house here, a house here, and a house here. Mm-hmm. Those are where I want my three houses. I know what I love. This is what I want. This is my end game. And I don't want to feel that stress every day. So yep. for me, like private lending doesn't bring me that stress. Raising capital doesn't bring me that stress. Working with great partners on bigger buildings doesn't bring me that stress. It allows me to have the freedom to travel wherever mm-hmm. when I travel. So start at your end game and build backwards. And evaluate. you have to evaluate your business every year. Just like you said, I'm always constantly evaluating. What am I going to put my energy into this year to grow? Like what part of my life or my business do I want to grow? Mm, I love it. So yeah. April, you sold your house. You are on the road. Um, we're going to send you a carrot shirt, but where do we send it to? Like where? where- exactly. <laughs> so I put I put my address in uh, when I pulled out the podcast of my Perfect. son's house. It'll go to my son's house. Yeah. Perfect. And and one thing too that I, that just struck me. I'm like, when she sold her house, she had to have gotten rid of clothes, and somehow the carrot shirt made the cut. Which I'm of I'm, so, I'm so honored. <laughs> I'm so honored that the carrot shirt made the cut with the house sale. And uh, April, we're just so grateful to obviously have you as a as a client and a part of our community. But just being someone who's inspiring other people, uh, giving people a great example to follow. Um, none of us are perfect. We all have different models of what we're doing, but I absolutely love the way that you're going out there and doing it with intention. And it's a, a great thing for people to follow. So thank you. Uh, any, any parting words for the Carrot Cast community uh, as we leave this episode? I just always reflect back to like really just sitting with yourself and following your passion and what's on your heart and what you mm-hmm. want in life and really just blinders on, blinders on. Do not get distracted by what other people are doing at all. I love yeah. it. 
And where can people follow you? you? You got a YouTube channel you'd mentioned. Where else can people follow you on uh, your journey? Yeah, on YouTube, April Crosley. On Instagram, April Crosley. Those are the two best spots. I love it. And we'll link it up in the show notes, y'all. We'll link it up on the blog post as well. But as always, please, please, please go to Apple Podcasts. And if you resonated with April, with her story, with any of the things we talked about, all the way from building the business with intention to the bu- the financial buckets was an amazing unlock. That's going to be something huge for people that we- I didn't have intention on talking to. I'm so glad we did. Talked about raising money loaning money and really building a business that matches uh, your goals in life. So go over there, leave a rating and review. Did you get value from this? If so, let us know what it was and we'll share it with April and April. We appreciate you. Have an amazing trip, uh, travel you. safe, and uh, we'll get you that t-shirt uh, to replace the the old, the old uh, retro carrot <laughs> one that you've, that you've gotten. We're so grateful that you still do. So <laughs> thank, thank you for you having me. Thank you. Have an amazing rest of the week, y'all. Talk soon.